In this problem, we're dealing with uh, an example of coffee cup calorimetry or solution calorimetry, where we mix two things together, usually in a whole bunch of water, and there's something that happens inside of that mixture that we're trying to understand the energy change for. In this particular case, it's the reaction of aqueous silver plus ions with aqueous chloride ions to form the solid silver chloride. And it turns out that this is fairly straightforward how to do, but there are a lot of little bits and pieces and assumptions to this kind of problem and details that can make it a little more difficult. So this video is really gonna help you kind of sort out which of those bits and pieces you might be missing if you've been struggling to get the right answer. What I'd first like to do is kind of draw a picture of what's actually happening here so we can just get a better sense. You're going to notice that I can't draw, but it doesn't matter. It's really just about organizing our thoughts and getting a better understanding of what's happening. So if we look at what we have in the problem, we're taking 100.0 milliliters of a solution of silver nitrate, 1.00 moles per liter for the concentration, and a separate solution of 100.0 milliliters of 1.00 mole per liter sodium chloride, and these two solutions have been sitting out on my counter and they're both at room temperature, in this case 22.4 degrees Celsius. We're going to mix them together and a specific chemical reaction is going to happen. The aqueous silver ions and the aqueous chloride ions are going to mix together and form solid silver chloride. We find out when we do this the temperature of the solution is going to rise point by, uh, to 30.2 degrees Celsius. In other words, the water is increasing in temperature. There has been heat released by this formation process. And that should kind of make sense. We're taking a positive silver charge and a negative chloride charge and we're bringing them close together. In fact, we're actually forming an ionic bond in silver chloride. Now there's a lot of other complicated things going on because we have to kind of get the water molecules away from the silver plus and the Cl minus and so that's going to make a big contribution to everything that's going on and that's why we look at the reaction as it is. We're trying to figure out how much heat is involved per mole of silver chloride formed in this reaction. And then we see a few assumptions and whatever there that we'll talk about a bit later. But let's first draw that picture so we've got a sense of where this is going. We have a container of silver nitrate. Again, 100.0 milliliters of 1.00 moles per liter. We have a container of sodium chloride. Again, 100.0 milliliters and 1.00 moles per liter. Well, really, those are aqueous solids floating around in solution. So really what we've got is silver plus ions and nitrate ions floating around in here. We're not gonna worry about those nitrate ions because they're not part of the actual chemical reaction we're interested in, which means they're not gonna be part of the interesting change, which means they're not part of the system. They're just floating around doing nothing. We're gonna find that that's spectator ions in the net ionic equation for what's going on. Same thing's gonna happen on the other side. We've got sodium plus and chloride ions floating around on the other side, in the other container. We're not gonna worry about those sodium and what they're doing, because again, they're just kind of watching what's going on. Ultimately, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this solution and this solution and pour it into our coffee cup. And what we're gonna find is there's a few things we have to realize. We're mixing two solutions together, which means at the end of this all, the playground that those sodium ions and chloride ions are floating around in right after we mix things together, but before any chemistry happens, we can conceptually imagine we've turned off chemistry until we're ready for it. Well, we're gonna have a solution that contains silver plus ions and Cl minus ions, but that solution is gonna have a volume of 200 milliliters because we've added two separate 100 milliliter solutions together. We're not gonna worry about those concentrations just yet, but here we have it. Well, this is telling us everything that we need to know to understand the problem. What's gonna happen then is those ions are gonna to combine together and we're gonna start forming silver chloride solid at the end of this. And it's that formation of solid that's ultimately going to release heat 
into the water that this is happening in. And this is probably the first nuance that is going to give some people trouble with this problem. Even though the reactions happen in water with aqueous ions, the water itself is not part of the interesting thing. Think about a sport event or a concert. You're watching the band play on stage, you're watching the soccer players and the referees and everyone on the field, but you are watching, even though you're in the stadium, perhaps with 60,000 other people, you are not actually part of the interesting part of what's going on. You're just watching it. It turns out the water molecules are the same thing, which means the water molecules aren't part of the system, which means it's part of the surroundings. So really, our system, in this case, is the chemical reaction of interest. Silver plus in aqueous solution plus Cl minus in aqueous solution to give us silver chloride solid. Those three things are the important part of the change we're interested in. That it's all happening in water doesn't matter. The surroundings are going to include things like the water, the coffee cup, the air around everything, the moon, Pluto, and so on. But this is again part of calorimetry. We try and design things so the experiment is done fairly quickly so we don't have to worry about having to keep track of all the heat that got all the way up to Pluto because things were done before then. We don't have to worry about the moon. Don't need to worry about the air around it. And in fact, we've said, let's assume that we can ignore however much heat goes into the coffee cup. In other words, we can ignore this. And all of a sudden, we have really simplified this problem by saying the surroundings in solution calorimetry is the water that it happens in. Everything else we're going to ignore because we've hopefully got things done quickly enough where we haven't given time for heat to escape the water effectively. Now, now that we've got that, we know that any heat change for the system has to be accompanied by an equal but opposite heat change for the surroundings. And in this coffee cup calorimetry question, we've essentially said through our assumptions that this is what's happening. Whatever heat our reaction releases, and we know it's releasing heat into the water because the water as part of the surroundings is seeing a temperature increase, then that's what we need to know. And again, Q says equals minus Q water in this case, just the manifestation of the first law of thermodynamics. Whatever happens to our system in terms of energy change, the equal but opposite thing has to happen for the rest of the universe. And we're saying the rest of the universe that matters is the water that it's happening in. Well, that means Q cis should equal negative M C S delta T all for water because that's what we're measuring the temperature change for. In calorimetry experiments, we don't measure things directly for the reaction, the system. We measure what's happening to the surroundings and tie it back in through the first law to give us information for the system. We don't know the mass in this particular case, but that's another assumption that we've been given. Assume the mixed solution has a heat capacity and density equal to that of pure water. Is that really true? Not really, but as long as these solutions are reasonably dilute, in other words, not a lot of stuff floating around that isn't water, it's gonna be close to true. You can imagine if I start putting more and more and more stuff dissolving it in water, that yeah, that density is gonna change and the heat capacity is gonna change because really heat capacity ties back again to the kinds of motion that are allowed. If I've got stuff other than water, that's gonna change how I can store heat, that's gonna change the heat capacity. But again, we're assuming those don't matter in the context of our experiment. If I wanted to actually be a little more exact and precise, I would have to figure out ways to account for that. In this course, we don't need to. We're looking at the basics. We don't have a mass, but what we do have is we have a total volume of solution after mixing. And again, it's really pointed out that it's the mixed solution that's going on. We saw that's 200 0 0.0 milliliters. And we're seeing the density of water is 1.00 grams per milliliter. 
So it doesn't take much for us to realize, we could do the whole formal calculation here, that mass equals density times volume. Well, that's going to be 1.00 grams per milliliter multiplied by the 200.0 milliliters of net solution that the energy is being transferred to. That's the new amount of water. Again, there was no reaction given off heat until we put everything in the same pool. Well, that pool is 200.0 grams of water. So now we have the mass. We see the specific heat capacity in this problem. Again, we'd have to look it up unless we've remembered it. We know specific heat capacity for water is 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So we've got that. And why don't we calculate a temperature change while we're at it? Tf minus Ti. And again, this is the temperature change for water. We've seen all the way back in here, we go from 22.4 to 30.2. To so that's 30.2 degrees Celsius minus 22.4 degrees Celsius. That's going to be, what, 7.8 degrees Celsius. Again, that temperature change is positive. The water, the surroundings, is taking in that heat. It's getting warmer because of it, because the system is giving that heat off. Signs are important in this particular case. Because of that, when we go back and say Q sys, what's going on here? Q sys, there we go, equals minus MCS delta T for the water. Well, that positive temperature change and that negative in the water side or the surrounding side of this math is ensuring that our Q system is a negative number. The heat is leaving. It's going into the water. It's going into the surroundings. Therefore, we see a lowering of the total energy content of the system. How much in this case? That's going to be the minus 200.0 grams are 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius and are plus 7.8 degrees Celsius. That's going to be, again, handy dandy calculator, always needs to be around 200 times 4.184 times 7.8. Of course, there was a negative sign on all of that. That's minus 6,527 joules. We've done enough calculations like this where we can very quickly say, of course, this per degree Celsius cancels out that degree Celsius. This per gram cancels out that gram. We're left with units of joules. So we're releasing 6,527 joules of heat. But let's be careful. Let's go back and look at the questions and seeing exactly what it's asking us. What is Q reaction per mole of silver chloride formed? So we need to ask ourselves, have we formed a mole of silver chloride? And the answer to that is no. If we go back here and we look at our original solution containing silver, we had 100 milliliters of a 1.00 mole per liter solution. That solution must have contained 0 0.100 moles of silver plus, not one whole mole. When we do the same kind of idea for sodium chloride, we see that we're going to have 0 0.100 moles of chloride ions. Well, the balanced equation is a one to one situation. So if I had one mole of silver plus and one mole of chloride, I would make one mole of silver chloride. But I don't have one mole of either of them. I have 0 0.100 moles. In other words, this reaction is going to form 0 0.100 moles of silver chloride. One tenth of a mole. Therefore, for one mole, Q would equal the minus 6,527 joules divided by the 0 0.100 moles of silver chloride we actually make. That's going to be minus 65,270 joules, which to, let's say, the two sig figs we're going to be allowed for our temperature is minus 65, and there should be per mole there, 
kilojoules per mole. Now we saw combustion reactions tend to give off energy in the hundreds to thousands of kilojoules per mole. A lot of ionic solid formation reactions aren't going to give off that much energy. Again, because there's an energy input that has to be made to strip away the water molecules from the ions before they can come together to form those strong ionic bonds. So at first we'd expect a lot of energy release, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. But this is coffee cup calorimetry. You're going to be doing something like it in your notebook and spreadsheet project if you're doing the Thompson Rivers University 1523 course. And I think you will learn a lot of interesting stuff from that.